Yeah, you kind of have to unlearn what you think you're supposed to do as you grow in this songwriting thing. Yeah, I just think the, the simple language, I was messing around during like a sound check like 15 years ago at, at this night service and the verse just like came out, you know, cause it's just that one scripture and I happened to be checking it out and I think I went home and, and finished the other part. My friend Darren Clark, we were leading together that night and he's like, um, it's a good sign when the, when the setup crew is worshiping to your, your new song. Welcome to the Ferment Podcast, conversations about worship and transformation. Today's guest is worship leader and songwriter, Ryan Delmore. Ryan Delmore, we're finally doing this. Can't believe you're sitting in my dining room, man. This I is, can't either. Is, I'm in California crazy. during the plague year. <laughs> Does the government know you're here? I, I don't know. I did not confirm this with Gavin Newsom. <laughs> I've gone rogue. Vineyard rogue. Vineyard rogue. That's a special kind of rogue. Anyway, no, I am super, super happy to be doing this because... Just so everyone knows, I want to document this straight up front. Yeah. You're one of my favorite worship leaders. I think you're one of the best singers ever, bro. Come on, man. You're, you're uh... pumping you up here. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's very kind. Yeah, but it's actually true. It has the added yeah. benefit of actually being true. Thanks, buddy. Well, hey, let's do this. I've got some stuff I want to talk to you about, but this is what we normally do. Talk to me about how you grew up. We start with history. Okay. Where'd you grow up? What was your life like? Man, I grew up right here. My folks met in Los Angeles. My mom's from Michigan. She uh, followed her brother out here in like 68 or 69 to LA. She was a telephone operator back when you had to plug in, you know. Oh yeah, I've seen that in the movies. Switchboard operators. My dad grew up down there working pizzerias, restaurants, and they met, fell in love, moved up here. Restaurant business brought my dad up here. Where is up here? Central coast of California. So we're yeah. about three and a half hours north of Los Angeles, three and a half hours south of San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, Central coast, they call it. But yeah, they moved up here and uh, started a pizza place called Dell's Pizzeria. That's right. For, I've heard uh, of it. Yeah. That was in 73, and that was just a few months before I was born. So they opened a pizzeria and had a kid the same year, and I was... I'm running that place now. Man, it's a so, family tradition. Yeah, it's always been there. It's it's like my older sibling. But yeah, I grew up here just surfing, playing soccer, running around lettuce fields and, you know, just... Yeah, because uh, it's kind of a farming community, isn't it? Yeah, big, huge agriculture here. And uh, yeah, it's a good mix to grow in. You got cowboys and surfers and, you know, immigrants and everything in between. Yeah, I, I was noticing when I was driving up to your place here just even an hour ago i was kind of coming through these ranches and was like cattle ranch vineyards lettuce farm yeah and then there were signs pointing off saying well there's the beach just right over there yeah. all, the whole way so it's yeah. it's kind of a an eclectic community yeah it's it was fun growing up here um you know you'd see guys i had friends in high school who you know came from farming families and stuff and they'd pull up in their big trucks and their cowboy you know gear and then go surf yeah <laughs> and then go to school and yeah. then hit home and and work the family land and so i was born raised and never left <laughs> you're a central coast kid i am all was, right so was your family a family of faith no my folks were raised both in the catholic faith you know yeah. but uh, you know kind of a distant yeah, so, uh, sort of non-practicing Catholics. Yeah, and yeah. so when they met and stuff, they weren't they weren't uh, necessarily going to church and stuff. And I think I went to church a couple times as a kid for you know holidays and stuff. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, I had a, a good buddy named Jay and his mother, who you know they lived a couple streets over. Uh, she went to the Vineyard Church in San Luis Obispo. And in that church, there was a couple who did a Monday night Bible study. It was for like surfers and skaters. And it was just in their home here in Arroyo Grande. And uh, he was also a surfboard shaper, kind of local legend. Okay, like, so you got to tell us what that means. What, what is a surfboard shaper? Um, that, that seems like jargon. Okay. He, uh, <laughs> he creates surfboards that you buy and ride okay. from chunks of foam that you know you just purchase and amazing yeah he it's it's an art form for sure and his name's pj wall 
and uh shout out pj pj wallboards pismo beach does he still do it yeah get out of here yeah shout out wallboards shout yeah. out pismo beach <laughs> yeah. love it already <laughs> he is the number one guy in my life as far as uh you know, besides my pops, you know, he's the guy that, uh, his house is where I believed in Jesus the first time. And anyway, so they had, so my, my folks split when I was 12. My buddy's mom, Arlene, who's a, an angel. I think so many of us are, uh, you know, we're the product of praying moms and even friends' moms. And yeah. it's, uh, I mean, I just think about her all the time and, um, and she saw that my folks were splitting and, and I was 12, and that's a pretty crucial age. So she asked PJ Wall, who had this group for mostly like high schoolers, you know, if me and my buddy Jay, who were 12, 13, if we could come, you know, just to like, she saw trouble coming. Yeah. And she said, I'm going to see if I can. And he said, yeah, him and his wife, Monica, you know, they let us uh, start showing up. And I think the second or third time is, I just remember sitting on his floor and, praying the the little prayer of, you know, come mm -hmm. to Jesus. And man, that was it. That was like amazing. Saved in a little vineyard home group in, you know, 1985. Full of just like street urchin skate rats. <laughs> oh yeah. It was because he was such a local legend. Sur I mean, he was a really good surfer. Almost. I Maybe he was pro. So he had all the respect of, uh, of everyone in the community. Everyone yeah. knew him. Everyone respected him. And the fact that he had this Bible study, you had kids there who wanted nothing to do with God, but wanted to be in that circle of, yeah. that's where the cool kids were, you know? And uh, amazing. tons of, tons of young gals, young guys, some surfed, some didn't, but it was just, uh, it was a magic, magic time. Okay. And, and so what year would this be, Ryan? That was, that was around 85. Oh man! So I was about twelve years old, thirteen, but they had been doing that group on a Monday night before that, and I just missed him. John Barnett was leading worship there for a short time because he lived the with man these, himself. He lived with these guys. No way! Uh, while working at a nuclear power plant out here, it's called Diablo uh, Nuclear Power Plant, and I just missed him. And so uh, they had moved to Orange County. It's just interesting. Years later, we became friends. And Yeah, it's so funny how that happens, isn't it? You guys were right on, your, your lives were overlapping. You just didn't yeah. know it. Yeah, this family, this local family, the Walls. Yeah, so that was about 85. I didn't play guitar or anything yet. I was just into surfing and skateboarding. And So when you met Jesus, what happened? Like you became a church kid or you, you just met Jesus and you just kept running around with your buddies, but not really a part of church. Tell me, yeah, what, what happened on no, that side of things? That's a good question. Um, so it was a Monday night Bible study, and that was my church. So I, was, I would surf Saturdays and Sundays because no school. I would just go Monday night for probably for four or five years. That was it. I didn't even know about Sunday morning Yeah, what stuff. is Sunday morning? Yeah. I didn't even, what so, is that? So it was awesome. I mean, we just had, it was so much fun. I I. My folks were really cool and letting me go to that because, you know, they weren't, you know, my mom was was busy working full time at the pizzeria. And so I'd always just get rides. And there was guys in that group, like older, you know, teenage dudes or like guys looking out for the younger guys. And they'd be like, I'll pick you up and bring you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll bring you home. They'd meet the mom. And yeah. it was amazing. Like, yeah. you know, strangers, like parents just going, I trust you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> I'll trust you. I, yeah. Who knows what's going on over there? But yeah, so we would just I would just go there. Eventually, I think I was 16 or 17, when I started driving, I, I was like, so where do, you, where do you guys go to church, like to PJ and Monica and some of the other guys? And they were actually going to a vineyard at, at that time in Santa Maria, which you drove through on the way up. Carl Tuttle was the pastor there at one point. He wasn't when I got there. but So I just started going Sunday mornings there with them. I'd catch a ride with them or go with them, and God was doing some really exciting stuff back then in Santa Maria Vineyard. It was kind of a, just a real, I keep saying magic, but that's how it yeah. felt. You know, it was just I, like, I, I like that word, out, yeah. by the way. Okay. Yeah. It's not weird. No, it's not a weird <laughs> word at all. I've been, it's been a word I've been using lots lately. Okay, good. Yeah. We all need a little magic. That's right. Know? But yeah, so I uh, went there. That's the first place I played music in front of a, like a group of people. I played bass. Was, was church the reason you wanted to play music? 
Well, I loved music growing up for sure. Like yeah. uh, I grew up with, like a lot of us, with the record player. My favorite record growing up was uh, Poncho and Lefty. It was a uh, Willie Nelson, yeah. Merle Haggard record. That's outlaw music. Yeah. My dad was, he's the reason I probably dress like I do and, and like the music I do. <laughs> By the way, okay, so time yeah. out. So right now, Ryan's got a, he's got a plaid snap shirt. You've got a, a is it a Carhartt vest? It basically. Yeah, yeah. it's like a, it's, it's a rancher vest. That's what I yeah. would call it. And I'm not a rancher. <laughs> I'm a jolly rancher. <laughs> Aficionado. <laughs> oh. So that, that record in particular left a mark on you. Yeah. If, and this this will even this is funny too is at the time there's a movie called Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah, you know that movie. I do actually. Okay, and there was a car in it. It Burt was T top, Trans Am had a big eagle on the hood yeah. and these these roof you could take off and have basically a semi convertible. My dad loved that movie. And one day I'm sitting in the sitting in the living room, I hear this crazy engine revving right out in front of my house. I open up the door and there's that car. My dad's in it and he had bought it without telling my mom. Yeah. And he had a full on Burt Reynolds mustache. These boots I'm wearing were his. Somehow they fit me. Yeah. So he, he went through a cowboy phase all the while running a pizzeria. So it's kind of like I've just stepped into his whole world. And uh, yeah, you, you dress like him and yeah. now you, you run his business. Yeah. It's, it's insane. <laughs> But yeah, um, so I always loved music. You know, I, I was raised by MTV was my babysitter. So I love yeah. like, I still remember seeing the first uh, Tom Petty video I ever saw. Okay, which which video did you see? Was uh, You Got Lucky. Oh, yeah. Which is like, uh, it was one of the first videos where it was a, almost like a movie intro without the the song didn't just start. It was yeah, like it was cinematic. The, yeah, it was like Mad Max, you know, and then they go into this old bar and hit a jukebox and then the music kicks in but so all that you know um i loved music i used to like tape uh the radio you know i get a blank tape i don't think people realize what that means they don't right? know huh? like like you and i grew up that way that's true yeah a lot of folks that, that, don't know so yeah yeah in case in case you're wondering <laughs> what in the world is ryan talking about yeah. this is how desperate we were back in back in the day if you yeah. found a song that you like the dj would say hey yeah. i'm gonna play this yeah. song and you'd get your tape player ready and you'd press record right and you would record that yeah. radio song yeah. so you could have it right or you call it in you request it hey can you play you got lucky yeah and then you'd wait with your like you said with yeah. your fingers on the trigger on your blank tape yeah the worst was when they would talk over the intro. Oh. Coming up next, Tom Petty. And, no, 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 no. and you're like, just let the song play. I'm trying to record this <laughs> so I can listen to it later. I just, I loved music and I know that it was something God, you know, put in my heart, like yeah. a lot of us. And then, you know, 12, 13 years old, coming into faith, there was this gal, Kelly, who played, uh, she played the guitar and led worship at the Monday night group. And it was just her. I think I think she was a school teacher. She was she was older. She wasn't yeah. like one of us kids. So, you know, like today where it's always like your peer, the coolest peer is the worship leader. Yeah. It it was like just a you know, a young married gal who taught school and mm. played like the simplest folk worship songs. Mm. And man, I just I fell in love with it and, and So did uh, the kids sing? Yeah, I mean, some did. It was, you know, yeah. a lot of them weren't there for it, so they were just awkwardly yeah. sitting there. But, I always love those moments. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. But but a lot of us did, and there was enough, like, mix of older folks who were, like, the support team. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just this couple, the walls. There was, like, four other couples sometimes, mm -hmm. kind of shepherds and, like, the elders of the group, you know? Yeah. But part of what I'm hearing in your story, Ryan, is how much community plays into your own life. Mm. Like, especially even meeting Jesus. You had a buddy, mm -hmm. his mom, yeah. the surf guy, the yeah. home group, the the lady who led worship. There's like this whole community around you that kind of builds the context for you becoming a believer, but then kind of stumbling in, into being a musician and yeah. a worship leader, right? Yeah, totally. No, it's uh, La Familia, you know, it's um, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I really just, I mean, it's kind of like old man looking back, you know, yeah. these days a lot more, but just seeing like the hand of God in every little turn of the river, it's like, it's pretty amazing. Like at the right time, God sends this person and, mm. you know. It's, so uh, when did you start playing some music? I mean, you said you played bass at the church. 
Did you play right. at the home group at all? I did actually. That was that was actually the first place I played, which was uh so around sixteen. I hated high school. <laughs> hated it. Like I just wanted to surf, and I tried to I tried to do this thing where you you know graduate early, and yeah. my mom was she wasn't into it. She actually, <laughs> I was like, no, I'm doing it. I'm out. I, I can't stand it. Like, and she went and talked to PJ Wall. <laughs> She's like, will you please talk to him? Yeah. And he'll listen to you. He won't yeah. listen to me. And, and so, and he, he did talk to me and thought it'd be a good idea if I stayed in. So I needed to, you know, I was like filling classes. So they had a guitar class and it was like the one music teacher in the high school does anything to do with music, taught a guitar class. And so mm. me and my younger brother, Darren, who is uh, two years younger, we actually took it, I think at the same time. Yeah. They just give you these beat up classical guitars, nylon string, no picks. <laughs> you know, we just use quarters because we wanted to rock. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even know how to buy picks or anything yet. We're just like, just use a quarter. Um, <laughs> but he taught taught us like the basics. So, borrowed a, a guitar from a friend, and and then so of course started asking for the song sheets from the from Kelly at the Monday night thing, like, hey, could I, could you print some extra so I could learn those? And they were, you know, simple enough. And do you remember the first song you learned? It was like, uh, as the deer yeah. panis for the water. It was kind of those songs, those mm -hmm. Maranatha. Mm -hmm. There was some vineyard stuff, but the first song that I like fell in love with was a uh, holy and anointed one, okay. which is around JD. 88, 89. Yeah. I remember just singing that. I didn't know who wrote it, but that yeah. song is the one that, like, you know, my buddy, uh, he's a pastor in Texas. He's like, you know how couples have songs? Like, yeah. what's you? Like, what's your and Heather's song? Yeah. Do you have one? I don't know if we do. Yeah. Uh, I know. It's a hard question. That's a hard question. I'll have to come back yeah. to that. It's not Take My Breath Away. Or... It's not. I, even <laughs> though I think that song was around when we were there. It's probably something off. I don't know that we have a song, but, yeah. like, the iconic ones were... Maybe the ones off the Titanic soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, that was everyone's song. Yeah. Or Unchained Melody. From yeah, Ghost. definitely. Yeah, there you go. Or uh, I'm Your trying to think. better than mine. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else. But he's like, you know how, you know how couples have songs? He's, mm -hmm. And my buddy's like, what's your, what's your and Jesus song? And I'm like, it's got to be Holy, Holy and Anointed, Anointed One. one. So yeah. JB. Shout out JB. John Barnett, legend. Yeah, so that one was like... And that one had like a B minor, which was tough on me. Like that made me work for it. Mm. It wasn't just a D again. <laughs> Dang it! Yeah, see, when I was when I was learning all those songs, when I saw the B minor, I would just move everything to G and play E minor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You know, you got to cheat it a little yeah. bit. Thank goodness for capos. That's right. Yeah. So I learned. I was starting to learn the chords, and then again, this this angel. Kelly said, why don't you strum along with me this week? And I, I'm sure it, it sucked and was rough. And then she, keep, she kept letting me. And it's funny because none of the other guys my age at that point, had a lot of them had kind of bailed. It was like around 16, 17, that crew. You, you, you saw a lot of guys, you know. Yeah, like they got their license and they just went and did their thing. Yeah, and, and you know, just partying and, and some rowdy living. So I, I just... I think just stuck around and was like, oh, I want to do this, you know, and yeah. then, you know, she'd be like, why don't you sing one song and then two? And then finally it's, you know, I'm doing the whole, the whole set <laughs> in the living room. Yeah. Epic, epic moment. And, uh, yeah. So then, you know, I started farting around with, uh, with a bass or I think, you know, at that age, you're just buying like the cheapest gear and trying to like learn it all. And mm -hmm. when we started going to that little vineyard in Santa Maria, and another gal, Cindy Goff, who uh, she was in the vineyard for uh, a long time. Yeah. And a great, amazing worship leader. And, and she wrote some really cool songs, too. And, yeah, just let me hack it up behind her on the bass. And, I mean, that was probably even worse than when I led in the... Because, you know, that's playing with a band. And yeah. I probably just had the top string on. And <laughs> Well, and, and the bad part about the bass is... I mean, if you mess up at all, everyone is definitely going yeah. to know. Yeah, and I probably just played it like a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was like, I was hooked. I'm like, yeah, so man, that were, was so fun. Those were formational moments. Yeah, and it's it's like let people letting me just like fail, you know, with them. It's, it's amazing. And I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen that now in my own life where it's just like, just 
let's go. Like, and it'll be rough. One song, great the next. And then years it's, later, they're killing it. Yeah, it's funny how that really is the best way of being brought up or bringing someone up is just making some room for somebody. And Yeah, share. I'm sure you've you've seen a lot of that. Yeah, like, definitely. Because you got young guys playing, right? Oh, yeah. Your always, kids and, always, always having young guys. And and I was a young guy. And, and I, I can't even think about my story without thinking of, you know, Pastor Ray, who was the pastor when I was especially a young buck. And we we were leading worship and he and we were not good. And we wrote all of our own songs and we we kind of had a stick it to the man attitude, but he just kept letting us do it. Yeah. And yeah. everybody grew. Yeah. You know, he just totally. kept making a space for us. It's amazing. Yeah. That's the way it works. It is. Well, hey, yeah. I wanna I wanna maybe dig in on this a little bit. Yeah. I want to talk about your music for a second here. Okay. One of the things that I think about when I think about your music and the way you lead worship, I always come back to the fact that you have a very original sound. Original in the sense of like the worship context, yeah. right? Because we live in a moment where worship has become, you know, it's worldwide, it's it's everywhere. And most Sunday morning worship is is something that I would call stadium worship. Yeah. It, it's kind of, sure. it's kind of, it's it's you too. It's Coldplay. Yeah, it's big. It's big, <laughs> and and that's not what you do. It's not what you do at all. In fact, if I think about what you do, what you do is it's like Americana folk. It's it's country music, and I, maybe you've already begun to answer this, but tell me where that came from, yeah, and how that happened. Well, I think it was it was growing up with with the records, a lot of Willie Nelson, a lot of um. My favorite TV show was Dukes of Hazard as yeah. a kid, you know. Um it's this weird mix of Star Wars and Dukes of Hazard and you know a lot of the stuff we grew up with, but yeah, the music, I don't know, it must have been my dad must have listened to it a bunch or it just it just hit me. I mean, I liked all the music growing up in the 80s. I was yeah. like I listened to Duran Duran, Def Leppard, yes. The Ramones, Tom Petty and then Willie Nelson, it was all in there. So I think, you know, and that, that happens a lot with, with, with guys as we grow. And then late teens, early 20s, I was like uh, in a record store and I was buying a Bob Dylan CD. And uh, th do people still know what CDs are? <laughs> yeah, I think they do. <laughs> and uh, maybe this was back when there was record stores around here. And, um, and it was really cool because you'd go in there and, and the guy working behind the register was like a bit of a guru, you know. So he'd see what you're buying. His name was Bob. And it's this place called Big Music. And uh, he every time I'd buy something, he'd go, you should check these guys. out. Like, he knew what went with what and like yeah. started me on this, uh, you know, this journey of like, uh, all these great Americana-ish bands back then. And one of them was Uncle Tupelo. Of course. Which was, when they broke up, they became Sunvolt and Wilco. That's right. That that CD, because it was like punk rock, but bluegrass country. Yeah. And, you know, they are probably a couple years older than me. So I'm just like, holy smokes. Like this, this feels like Nirvana, if Nirvana was like country. That's right. A little it, bit. It, it definitely is. Yeah. And so... um for some reason that just hit me and I just wanted to be <laughs> Uncle Tupelo. And then, so listening to them, you go, you see like they're doing Carter family songs, they're doing Stanley Brothers songs. And so you chase those down, get back to the roots of all that stuff. And uh, so I just kind of went like on a just expedition of finding. Well, Ryan, what I love music. about that, I, I, I love it because it's made you an original. And then the other thing that I love it is that not only have you become an original, but I love that you've stuck to it, that you didn't go, ah, oh, <laughs> this is not what worship records sound like anymore yeah. or whatever. And so I need to change, but you've kind of found your thing and you've, you've leaned into it rather than leaning away from it. And so I guess I'm just kind of interested in not only why you leaned into it, but how, how have you kept leaning into that sound? Is it just, does it still feel alive to you? Mm. Yeah, it does. I love it. I mean, I mean, I, I would be mistaken if I didn't mention John Barnett again. I know I mentioned him a lot. No, but, that's okay. But um, he was hugely influential to me yeah. in my life because I met him 
about 16 or 17 through a friend of the walls and uh, got to like witness him having like a, a Sunday morning practice in his garage, like on a, you know, Friday or something. I just happened to go to his house when they were practicing and it was like Neil Young and Crazy Horse were practicing. I'm like, <laughs> this, yeah. you know, because at that, at that point I was just used to the really stripped down folk Mm -hmm. living room thing but i was just like so i got you know i got he was putting out tapes cassette tapes of original songs and uh, i was getting that stuff that th he was the guy i saw doing it there was some local guys too scott underwood yeah. was a guy who was uh he was pr he was pretty kind of country actually back mm. when he did his first vineyard recording called uh hallelujah glory i think yeah, yeah anyway. scott has a lot of blues influence yeah and so, I mean, he had a lot of shuffle beats back then and harmonica and like nobody was really doing that. Even then, it mm -hmm. was less than less than now. Yeah. So, you know, I had guys who were in the worship world even who was like, oh, man, that's that's awesome. And mm -hmm. it's just the music that I love to listen to. It's weird because I don't really. It's confession time. You, yeah. said, you said, be honest, like I don't listen to worship music. Yeah. Hardly ever. Unless it's like. Uh, something real special like the Liz Vice record that came out a few years ago. Yeah. But I just, I like the music that I like, you know, like we all do. Yeah. But um, when it comes to writing it, you know, it's like, I don't want to write anything that's not a, about Jesus or for him. Yeah. So I think the, it's just putting the, the words into the, the music I like. And that's probably what, you know, it's this weird, <laughs> this weird combination. You know, when I listen to some of your music, I hear some influences, and I, I don't know if I don't know if they're if they resonate or not. But I hear I hear things like Dwight Yoakam and and some of that yeah California oh, thanks country stuff. You know, <laughs> yeah, I love Dwight Buck Owens. You know, some of that guitar mm. vibes. Yeah, no, those guys are. Yeah, they were all just three hours away mm -hmm. so it's yeah it was weird it was like country coming from your backyard in a way yeah it's, it's that, a very interesting dynamic especially when i think of california as someone who's not a californian mm -hmm. that that feels like a paradox but really it is something that's unique here yeah yeah i mean merle haggard was was bakersfield you know and uh buck owens dwight ended up there yeah. i think dwight was from kentucky though yeah he was so he ended up coming yeah. out probably for following buck i'm sure well this is something that casey and i've talked about mm -hmm. before we maybe switch gears again yeah one of the things that casey and i'm talking about casey quorum here one of the things that we've noticed in the vineyard is that there's certain things that percolate up through vineyard worship naturally without anybody really making it happen or trying to be smart yeah but there's four kind of worship sounds that typically pop up mm. so one would just be maybe what we would consider to be straight down the middle modern worship. Sure. Yeah. Um, more recently, in the last few years, there's been a, a real black gospel thing mm. from actual black gospel musicians who go to actual vineyard churches. That's cool. So yeah. it's not even anybody trying to be smart. It's just like an actual yeah. expression of the vineyard. Yeah. And then even more recently than that, one of the new things that's happening in the vineyard is there's there's a real bilingual thing. 
Oh, so nice. Spanish and English, yeah, kind of this Spanglish yeah. thing that's kind of happening, and I'm just very excited about it. Yeah. But the fourth thing mm-hmm. is always there's always been this Americana country worship strain mm. that's in the vineyard. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's so unique that mm. that our movement has been able to express some very very different things that you wouldn't typically put together. Yeah. But it's naturally who we are, and it's and it's not because someone's going, oh, we need to be smart and. The market wants this, right. but instead, this is just kind of like who we are as vineyard people. Yeah, no, it's cool. I think, um, I mean, I just think the the style is very. It's a, it's a good, good thing to worship too. It can be it can be really fun and joyful. You know, a lot like a lot of the gospel stuff, like you know, just like the hoot nanny praise joy stuff, and yes. then you know, it's it's very emotional. I mean, you got like. You could listen to Jason Isbell and just start crying. You know, some of his songs are so, so good, so beautiful, and that that same feeling I think just in that style of music can can work in. It works in worship. You just have certain guys, certain weirdos who are doing it, and they're in the vineyard. And vineyards about like, if you're a vineyard worship leader and you're writing these songs and you're singing them, then we want to record them and share them. And that's been the wonderful thing is like, it's just like. When you hear someone who's uniquely them, I mean, it's just, it's so, whether it's, whether you like it or not, you can tell it's, it's true yeah. and it's like honest and, and Well, that's always been one of our vineyard through. values, right? It's like authenticity. Yeah. Which I think also has to extend to things like style. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we want to be current. We want to be modern. Yes. Sure. But, but I, I'm, yeah. I'm actually more interested in the thing that. Yeah is uniquely about the person. Yeah. And if you can strip it all back to one guitar, one piano, I mean... It's a win. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a couple questions about songwriting, because that's that's a little bit about sort of the the style that you come from. But I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was not just that, but maybe a bit about how you write songs. Because one of the things I've noticed in your songwriting over the years, oh, well, A, there's a... A few things. One would be a lot of your songs have really plain language. Mm. And I mean that in I mean that as a compliment. Yeah. That, that's not a compliment burn. <laughs> <laughs> but your your songs How do you are, write such dumb lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was trying to say, Ryan. Uh, no. Have you heard of a dictionary? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. Not at all. But but there's there's a kind of poetry in your songs, but it's plain language. It's like common man's language. Yeah. So that'd be one aspect of your writing. But then an, another aspect that I've noticed is a lot of times, a lot of times your songs are A, B format. Hmm. Like there's a, yeah. there's a verse, yeah. one verse, yeah. there's a chorus. <laughs> yeah. And we just kind of go back and yeah. forth between them, <laughs> which I really love those kinds of songs. And, you know, I'm, I'm using air quotes here. Yeah. The industry has moved <laughs> away from those. Okay. You know, there's, you know, now we all write verse one. Pre-chorus, chorus, verse two, oh, yeah. chorus. I don't even know what those are. <laughs> Bridge, you know, something completely different, yeah. which that's fine too. But I just, as a worshiper, and then as someone who sometimes leaves worship, I just really appreciate an A-B format a lot of times because, gosh, it just, there's a hospitality in it mm. for the for the worshiper. That's like, cool. Man, I don't have to learn 187 more words. Yeah. The, these, these handful of words right here can do the trick. So I, I would love it if you would just maybe talk to me about that. Talk to me about your writing style or where you come from or how you start a song. How do you know it's done? Hit, hit us with some of that. Yeah, I love that hospitality for the worshiper. That's no, a great line. I, I've been think, well, I was thinking about it on the way up here because I was thinking about like why. Okay, so your song, Down at Your Feet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's probably my favorite song you've ever written. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, I really love that song. We've been playing it at our church for, I don't know, yeah, six or seven years cool. since we heard it. Mm. It's one of those church songs I've I've told people this should be played in every vineyard church, big or small. I just I think I think the theology is so solid, but then I think it's <laughs> I think it's beautiful. Yeah. But then beyond that, I was thinking about it on the way up here as I was driving. Like, why do I love this song? And I was just thinking about the simplicity of it. But more than that, it just it feels like even the first time I heard it, I felt like I knew it. Mm. And there's just something about that that feels caring and it feels hospitable mm. That's cool. for the worshiper. Yeah. You know, not yeah. me, the musician yeah. who wants to play X, Y, Z. Sure. 
So I, that's just yeah. something that I've noticed in your writing, and I, I, I'd love to yeah. hear what you think about that. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a buddy who affectionately dubbed me the accidental songwriter. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? <laughs> Basically, um, I think, like you said, how do you know when it's done? It's like I, I'm, a lot of times I don't, and it's just be like, this is what I got for now. And, and that's happened where I've had to record something. All I had was that, and then it just, we Stay. did it. I remember one time I had this song, was recording with Bobby Hartree. Yeah. And he's like, ah, oh, it really needs, really, I think this really needs a third verse, not just repeat the first one again. Yeah. And so it was like, you know, oh, man, homework. Like, so I had to, like, I had a few hours to, like, write a two-line verse, which is, shouldn't, shouldn't be that hard, but for me, it, it, it took, like... And thankfully it worked out, but, um, <laughs> you know, there's been a few times where it's just like, I mean, I'm sitting on a lot of songs right now that are just, I think they're done, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I used, I used to not second guess myself as much. I don't know if it's part of getting older or you just like get pickier or yeah. I don't know how. Well, it's amazing. Sometimes when we're younger, you just don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so I was listening to... There's this podcast I love. It's called Broken Record. You ever, you oh, ever yeah. Listen, you ever I listen? did listen to a couple. Yeah, Rick, Rick Rubin. Rubin. Oh, my gosh. I love Rick. Yeah. I, I'm sort of infatuated with him right now. Go but, find him. He's down there. I know. I got to go. <laughs> I, someone, take me to Shangri-La. <laughs> anyway, but one of the things that Rick was saying, this was, I listened to this early in the year or something, hmm. but he was talking about making records, but I think it applies to songwriting, too. Hmm. He was talking about how oftentimes when a writer or a producer or a band guy is young and dumb and, and doesn't really know what they're doing. It doesn't really know how to turn the knobs yeah. right. You yeah. know, doesn't know how to engineer that oftentimes they find something that's amazing. Mm. And he was talking about it in, in respect to all of those early eighties records that he did where they were making, they were really making hip hop. Mm. He's like, we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. We were just making sounds and it, it felt yeah. good to us. Yeah. And then he goes, you know, now here I am all these years later and I know I know exactly how to engineer a record. I know exactly how to produce a record. Mm. I know how to get the drum sounds. And he goes, I'm fighting for that innocence of not knowing. Totally. Because the accidents, the happy accidents are yeah. in that territory. Yeah. And and I think a lot of this applies to songwriting too. There's there's totally. something about remaining a novice. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that, that can be helpful. Yeah. And sometimes like what we don't know is actually a gift. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of have to unlearn like what you think you're supposed to do as yeah. you, as you grow in this songwriting thing. Yeah. I just think the, the simple language, I mean, that song you're talking about, I think I, I was messing around during like a sound check, like 15 years ago at, at this night service and, the verse just like came out, you know, because it's just that one scripture and I yeah. happened to be checking it out. And I think I went home and, and finished the other part, you know. And my, my friend Darren Clark, we were leading together that night and he's like, um, it's a good sign when the, when the setup crew is worshiping to your your new song. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they're just like, we had all it these young works. people. And so, I mean, that, that song I think is was like just a gift and yeah. probably have... Uh, a handful of friends who songwriter friends who have, have also said the same thing like that's the song that that they like to sing and that's yeah. it's amazing because it was it was almost no work like it just sort of and it's so simple and i'm just like why don't why don't i do that all the time <laughs> the mystery you I can't you can't recreate it and uh i'm no, blessed that yeah I, I mean i hear that you, sometimes that's the way it just happens but there's also this sense in which all the other songs are the ones that are giving you the muscle memory for those moments, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you got to keep the well primed. Yeah, you, and, you keep it going. Yeah, I forgot what we were talking about before that. No, we were just talking about yeah. where do your songs come from oh, yeah. and how do they happen. They're just, I don't know, maybe listening to, uh, listening to you know, trying to listen to new music um, mm -hmm. that'll inspire like the chords or something. And I think the words are, you know, just trying to, I try to keep in the word and, you know, I've got a couple little like devotional books. The Valley of Vision is a really good mm -hmm. one. This little book of Psalms that, uh, that, uh, these monks kind of rewrote to like have more rhyme to them. Mm -hmm. So I get a lot of like, I'll be in there and I'll just like see these great little couplets and 
you know, that that'll go with something, some chord progression that I'm ripping off from something that I, yeah. you know, a lot of my stuff is just ripping off other people's chords and changing them a bit because I, I love them so much and I end up strumming and then some sort of melody falls out. But That's um, what we all do. Yeah. That's just rip off do. obscure <laughs> music. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, let's shift gears again. One of the things I was thinking about when I was driving up here is... You've been you've been leading worship for more than a minute now. A couple minutes. Yeah, you've been yeah. you've been at this for a while. Not only that, but you've you've raised the family now. Like yeah. you got you've even got one out of the house and <laughs> did it. <laughs> and that one has a kid yeah. as well. You know, it's yeah. like you've you've transitioned, you know, like you're in this other life space. You still lead worship, you've been doing it for a long time. You mm. you've you've raised a family, you've you've served church. I've been, I was thinking about that. Like you've served the church, like kind of like your whole life. Yeah, I, I'm interested in this. Uh, what keeps your heart alive after all these years? <laughs> oh man, the goodness of God, I guess. Um, I mean, I love, I love worship. Like I played today. I just played guitar for my friend Dano, and uh, you know, we had a, a little band that was a little rusty. It was so fun, and just like getting lost in the in the spirit and the in the music. I think you know, never feeling like. Like, I still don't really feel like I know what I'm doing. Like, I, I get nervous before I lead worship still on the way there. I'm just like, what? Well, why am I doing this? Like, how did I get to do this, you know? And then once we're in it, it's it's good. You know, I feel good. But it is like that community, like you're talking about earlier. It's just like, I can't wait to see my friends. Yeah. And now I've got like, like my son, the oldest one, the one we, we got out of the house, He's the drummer at the church. Hmm. My other son, Sam, he's 17. He plays bass. Wyatt, who you met earlier here, yeah. he's uh, he's playing uh, guitar and, and piano. So you guys have a family band. Yeah, we're getting, I'm trying to get it there to yeah. where I don't need friends anymore. I just made them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I created my own friends. Yeah, you don't have to call anybody yeah. late at night yeah. anymore. And our daughter, who I don't think you met, but her name's Katie. She's 20 and yeah. she plays guitar, piano, and... Who's going to play the tambourine? I think Johnny. <laughs> Johnny, the tambourine. The jingle bells and yeah. the tambourine. But, uh, you know, yesterday I played a friend's winery because they were, they were having like this holiday blowout sale. And so I just set up in a corner outside and as people came in and bought, you know, wine and gifts, I was just over there singing songs, worship songs, Christmas songs. And, uh, I just, I just love still playing, I mm. think. And, uh, then watching the kids grow, and I got like the cutest little granddaughter now. She's a year old, and I'm like, I can't believe my son met <laughs> met a girl who <laughs> would take him. He's he's a good kid, but <laughs> she she is an angel. Solid burn. I mean, yeah, solid burn. Yeah, but he's a good kid. Now they have this beautiful granddaughter, and mm. I just every day. I can't believe like my life is so good. I mean, I I work in a pizzeria. I don't have to dig ditches or that's right. You know, clean sewers or whatever. It's it's fun work and married a beautiful, hilarious gal who sings sings with me. Yeah, Sarah sings really great harmonies with me, and uh, you know she's the reason for all this. You know, I'd, mm -hmm. I'd just be a billy goat without her. <laughs> I think we all would be. You know. Oh. Um, so, I mean, just the joy, like, I, it's amazing. Like, our marriage has has just gotten, like, more fun mm. and, like, sweeter with time. I don't know how. I think just staying close to the Lord and staying close to each other and mm. singing together is really fun, too. Like, yeah. that. Like we've gotten to travel and do some really fun stuff in the last few years that it, it kind of came later. Like, when we were young, she, she never sang. Mm. She was shy and didn't think she sang good and... I don't know, it's probably been eight eight years now that all of a sudden this like new thing that God gave us and I mean we're not we're not amazing, but it's it does the job. You know? No, I love that. And she but makes again, she makes me sound way better. But than again, by myself. even what you're sharing is just it's it's back to that community idea, right? Like that's the thing I hear you say that's keeping your heart alive. Yeah. It's your wife, yeah. it's your kids, it's your church, it's your friends. Yeah. I got good good buddies good guys that we try to write songs with and keep each other inspired and mm. yeah man well let me ask you another question what seems important now that didn't at first man that's good i don't 
care as much about like trying to be be known or you know when I was younger the dream of making a living as a musician as a worship leader seemed like the goal you know what I mean like like at the time when we got married it was like Delirious and Matt Redman like these guys were they'd they'd come through town and you'd be like oh man that looks so fun like yeah like this is their life you know not knowing anything about them or you know if it really was it just seemed like they were making a living doing that and you know I held out that hope for a long time I was like man not realizing that really the only way probably going to do it is is working for a church and I don't have the uh <laughs> I don't have those skills that I think it takes to mm. work full time at a church um mm. I'm just more of a I like to do things with my hands I love making you know making pizza dough and sauce and meatballs yeah. and stuff I grew up doing so I think being okay with just like like the music's still there it's just not like like I didn't make it in that world you know yeah. I don't even know if there is that world anymore I think it's a slimmer mm -hmm. slimmer workforce in the full-time music world especially these days but like that that's not as important like I'm happy just to jam and like there's so much less pressure when I lead worship now. Like I used to like, we got to nail it and it's got to be, you know, I want it to sound like Ryan Adams and the Cardinals. And it's just like <laughs> these kids like, we don't even know. This we is the first like time we've guy. heard this song. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. don't know who Brian Adams is. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> so that that's less. Like I'm having more fun with music now than probably ever have. Hmm. And then also just what's important is being around. You know what I mean? Being here for the kids and it's not like about me anymore it's about them and it's about how can i help them and and serving the church and i don't know that's, that's beautiful it's rambling but no it's not it's beautiful it's we, not we, yeah we we need to hear those kinds of things more and more especially young young guys and young yeah. gals they need to, they need to hear that you yeah know? and it's not like i don't feel like i've given up like yeah like i'm retired out to pasture it's just different no, what I hear and what you're saying is that the dream is different than you thought it was. Yes, that's good, man. You're you got good ones. I'm, not, I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> the really dream close. is Just, different. Yeah, the real dream is different than yeah. what you thought it was. You know, totally. you know, if if the dream can only be touring like Matt Redman. Yeah, right. I mean, Which seems so fun. Yeah, but maybe maybe the dream is right here. We're in your house. It's this is the dream. This is the dream. It's a it's a wonderful life <laughs> that's right well let me okay let me ask you one more serious question yeah all right one of the things i've been thinking about lately is how sometimes i don't know walking with jesus or the spiritual life is kind of connected to letting some things go and may, maybe it's just similar to what we just talked about and if it is that's fine we can move on but I, i'm wondering as you've matured in this what have you had to let go of is there anything that you've had to just like go, you know what? I'm just going to have to turn that loose. Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, it could be a little similar to what we, we were saying. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like the dreams have changed and uh, being okay with the gifts that you got, you know? Like I know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I still cannot stand to hear my own voice recorded. I'll, I'll like to listen to some songs for the music that was created. Yeah. But it, as soon as I hear my voice, I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so it's just like letting go of like, not, not that it's a false humility, but going like, this is what I got. And hopefully it blesses people. Cause you still want to do it. You still want to write songs, record. It's like a, a weird addiction or disease. You're like, I hate it, but I also have to do it. I love it. Yeah. I don't. I don't know, man. Letting go of dreams that that were ours and not God's. You know, like and agendas and being okay with just the simple, simple things. I love that. But. I, I really love that. Because I don't know. That's not a great answer. I was hoping not, to be way more poetic. No, oh, man. I think, that's a, I think that's a pretty great answer, Ryan. I mean, yeah. I know sometimes, I know sometimes even for me, we, we grab so tight to one specific outcome. 
you know, not realizing that, man, maybe the thing that God has given us is all around us, you know, whether that's the wife or the family or the job or the place we live or even kind of what you were sharing there just a moment ago. Like, these are the gifts that I've been given. Yeah. You know, being able to to have an honest appraisal of who I am and what God has done in me, whether that's like musicianship, writing ability, singing ability, and being okay with that. Yeah. I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a while to get there. It took me a while. Like, you know, I was, like I said, I was holding out for that, <laughs> that management position. <laughs> holding and, out for the bus. Uh, <laughs> I was pretty bummed for a while, just that I was working a job that I grew up working, but then realizing like God's provision, like that job, the hard work of my folks provided me with the freedom yeah. as a young man to become, you know, who I am and always having that like family biz. Like I didn't go to college. I barely made it out of high school, like we talked about earlier. And, and it was like, I'll, I just wanted to play music, surf, marry a good Christian girl. And that was it. And not realizing you got to make money at some point. Yeah. And my folks worked their butts off to provide this thing that God is thankfully, gratefully blessed and is still there. And, and now I'm working there. My kids are, I got three kids working there. And it's providing them with the freedom to go to you know school, college, and find out what they want to do. And so like the thing I despised, I felt like was a shackle, the pizzeria. You know, which I was just like, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to, you know, move on to my dreams was like, now I can't wait to get there. And like, I'm going to make some good, some good food today. Like That's right. for the people. I well, mean, we're it, back to hospitality. It is. Again, it's all kind of like, it's laying out a table, worship, food, you know. It's and, funny how it's all the same. <laughs> yeah. It's all worship. Mm -hmm. It's uh, It's making a place for people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love it. Beautiful. Okay. One last thing. This is not a question. This is a statement. Oh, this is oh a fill boy. in the blank. Okay. Okay. This is how we're ending all the episodes on season three. Okay. <laughs> is this season three? This is season three, my dude. Oh, yes. This is season three. Renewed. Episode two. <laughs> Who's on episode one? Sandra McCracken. Already done it. <gasps> no way. Yes. Dude, I She's, love her. She, we had a beautiful conversation. Oh, man. So you're following Sandra. Great. Can you put this one first? I can't I think, follow I don't her. Think I, I don't think we can now. Man. We're, we're committed. Yeah. I sing uh, We Will Feast in the House of Zion. How can you not? It's it's a perfect song. It's about feasting. It's That's right. Back to it. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So this is, how right. We're, this is how we're ending season three. Fill in the blank. Okay. And you can take a second if you All need. All right. One thing I know for sure is fill in the blank. Is God is good. <laughs> That's it, man. It's I know beautiful. for sure. It's beautiful. We'll end it there. <laughs> okay. We don't have to we don't have to carry on any more than that. All right, buddy. Perfect. Ryan, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Adam. Peace. <laughs>